Thank you for joining us on Bees on the Law, legal talk from the boss perspective. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide legal advice and is not meant to create an attorney-client relationship. Also remember, laws change and differ from state to state, so this is not a substitute for seeking legal advice in your jurisdiction on the current law applicable to you. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We're back to part two of our series on inclusivity in the workplace. And we're back with Kelvi Accardi Harrison, who, as we mentioned before, is a doctor in ethics, gender, and sexuality. And she is a published author of Sexual Deceit, um, a book regarding LGBTQ identities. And she uh, is currently a professor of philosophy and religion at Hutchinson Community College. And so, Susan, I forgot to introduce you when we got started. So please say hello. <laughs> It's okay. You know, it's you know so easily forgotten. I am Susan Dawson. I am the Illinois and Wisconsin Bee. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited to have you back again. We had such a great discussion last time, really just laying the foundation on terminology that's being used and how to start that, that cultural shift in your business, if you haven't already, to being more inclusive with um, the different um, pronouns that are being used. But one thing that uh, what, what we really want to talk about today is kind of more of those um, the the high uh, some of the um, I keep uh, uh, struggles people have uh, different struggles that we have in the workplace and where I find the confusion that comes in is a lot of times people confuse gender and sexual orientation um, which are two completely separate things but tend to be lumped together so can you talk a little bit about the difference between those two? Yes, absolutely. And thanks for having me back on the show. Uh, so gender identity and sexual orientation, all of us have both. Uh, it's just that if you're in um, the majority position on both, that meaning cisgender or heterosexual, you probably don't think about it anywhere near as much as people within the LGBTQ community. And so I think that that's often why gender and sexual minorities are put together, because uh, there are similar kinds of issues and discriminatory um, concerns that we have as a community. And there can be some um, slippage between the, the communities. I can say a little bit more about that. They are two separate things, and perhaps it's most helpful for people to think about that in the context of their own lives. So your gender identity is uh, what you're designated as, your sex designated as birth, male or female. In a couple of states in the United States, there's also intersex as an option there. And then it's how you identify. Do you identify as a man, a woman, non-binary? And all of us have a gender identity. We all also have a sexual orientation, uh, who we're attracted to and who we primarily choose to date uh, and or mate with, um, build lifelong relationships with, or even short-term ones. Uh, and so the dominant category would be heterosexual, uh, male and female partnerships. Uh, there are um, gay and lesbian relationships, male-male, female-female relationships, bisexuality, which somebody can be paired with what is often considered to be either gender. Uh, younger folks prefer the language of pansexuality, including kind of a more nuanced understanding of how gender works. It's not just male and female. We've got non-binary and gender non-conforming, so making room for more gender identities in there. Um, so gender identity is important or sexual orientation, because we have uh, people who we are attracted to, and usually their gender plays a very important role in that. Um, but there are two separate identity categories. They just play an important role cohesively. However, if you're transgender, that doesn't mean that you are necessarily um, of any kind of sexual minority. So you could be a transgender man, meaning you were designated at female as birth. You now identify as a man and you could be heterosexual. You're attracted to women exclusively. So you'd be a heterosexual transgender man. Does that help? That helps a lot. And I think mm -hmm. it also helps um, as we start talking about some of these issues um, that can arise in the workplace, because obviously one of the goals is to make the workplace more inclusive, because I think you noted last time, Kelby, there's a huge study um, by McKinsey um, that really shows that inclusivity creates a more productive and quite frankly, more profitable 
workplace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, people who feel supported and understood uh, in their workplaces or places of employment are better team players. They'll work harder and more collectively. So it's better for the business bottom line. And so one of the issues that I know um, can arise frequently is how do employers address employees who are resistant to the change or are having issues with another employee, for example, um, someone whom they believe identifies as female, but uses the male bathroom. How is how does an employer start a conversation with the employee who's having an issue with that? So I think we can start with the bathroom issue because that seems to be a source of anxiety in a lot of um, public spaces and work environments and schools. Um, the first thing to know is that the law is on the side of transgender inclusion, that trans folks are allowed to use whatever bathroom is um, in accordance with their gender identity. And research studies have shown 100% of the harassment in bathrooms when it comes to trans folks are against the transgender people. So there's never been a case where a transgender person has gone into a restroom that coordinates with their gender identity and has harassed someone else. That seems to be the anxiety. Typically, they are the one who gets harassed. Right. So an employer needs to be mindful of that and mindful to protect the trans person's rights in being able to use the bathroom safely without being harassed, without being given side glances, hurtful commentary um, in a way that all of us want to feel safe in the restroom. Um, there can be some slight facilities modifications done to restrooms if this becomes a source of anxiety for folks. Um, little strips of metal can be added to the outside of a stall door to cover that gap that is so common. It's a very cheap upgrade, very affordable upgrade, and can make everyone feel just a little more comfortable in a restroom, like they have a little more privacy. Um, as a general rule, cisgender folks have bathrooms everywhere that they can use comfortably, and transgender folks do not. Um, so let's say that there is a employee who feels very uncomfortable using the restroom on the floor that they work on because a transgender colleague also uses that restroom. It is, unless they work in a tiny little office, I am almost certain there is a restroom on a different floor that they can access or in a different building right next door that is going to feel cisgender completely to them. But what needs to be important and needs to be prioritized is the safety of the transgender individual using a restroom safely that's convenient to their workspace. Um, and so that can be the conversation of that level of importance. That's great advice, actually, I think. Um, and how do you, for example, um, I know you mentioned a little bit how it's okay to mess up a pronoun or it's okay to mess up how you refer to someone. I've done it myself and it's very easy to self-correct if you're aware. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you recommend that employers address employees who just, you know, simply choose not to get it, as I say, or mm -hmm. don't get it? This is where... Um, harassment and discrimination protections come into play in a workplace environment. And so um, it is not a violation of the law to accidentally make a misstep on somebody's gender pronouns. If you correct it, if your intentions are to be respectful, you're fine. But if you're intentionally misgendering someone, you're intentionally ignoring um, their stated identity, their stated gender pronouns, uh, then there are repercussions and there should be disciplinary action against an employee who's insistent upon, I will not use she, her for this colleague. I see them as a man and I don't believe in transgender identities. Uh, that is a form of discrimination and should be dealt with as any other form of discrimination would be dealt with. Right. And, and I think the important thing also, you know, for the employers out there is if you're not addressing these employees who are not being inclusive or who are repeatedly purposefully being disrespectful um, to a uh, transgender or other identifying employee that you yourself could be subject to a lawsuit. Yes. Because absolutely. you're not disciplining your employees. And so I think it's really important here um, that these conversations start. 
even if they're uncomfortable for some people, and I know many people are uncomfortable just because they're either not familiar, sometimes it's ignorant, sometimes it's your belief, sometimes it's just not knowing how to get started. And so Kelby, do you have some recommendations for employers on how to get that conversation started so employers can avoid these kind of missteps? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I think it's key to build an inclusive environment and to expect an inclusive environment. And that can be done with some of the things we talked about in the last episode, pronouns in your signature and your email, introducing yourself with name and pronouns um, in addition to your position at the company. Um, people in leadership should have visible signs of inclusion in their office, whether that's a pronoun button that they wear, um, a, a progress flag that is on a shelf, um, ways of identifying that they are supportive um, and have an expectation of an inclusive environment. Um, if you're in leadership, it's really important to state your pronouns regularly to model that inclusive behavior. Uh, and it's always okay to ask people questions like, hey, what are your pronouns? Particularly on first meeting, that's really seamless. It's okay as a, a check-in, perhaps um, as a, say, a supervisor, you kind of have it in uh, your regular check-ins with your employees. Like, how can I be more supportive? Is there anything I can do to support you? And if you're asking all of your employees that on a semi-regular basis, you make room for an employee saying, hey, my gender pronouns are changing. Can we talk about how to have the work team come on board with that? Um, it's always appropriate to ask about the social climate at work for folks. So let's say that you noticed that an employee's gender expression has been changing and shifting. Um, it, it's completely okay to say Are everything going well with your colleagues to ask other colleagues, do you think everything is going well? Have you noticed any discomfort with anyone? Um, to just check in, make sure there is no harassment or bullying or uh, people having side conversations that are disrespectful. Um, I also think it's okay to check in with somebody to say, hey, I've noticed your sense of style has been changing recently. Um, is there anything I can do to support you in the workplace? Um, so just to, to make a comment, I've noticed some things have been changing. Um, those kinds of conversations, I think, are always import important and appropriate in the workplace. I think it's great the way that you phrased that, because many employers would go up to that individual and say, hey, I see you're dressing differently. Are you transitioning? Right. Are you they would they would jump right to the question. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really not necessarily appropriate. It's for that employee, that individual to come to you to express um, if they wish to talk about that transition, mm -hmm. but, but you're still, the way you phrased it is so beautifully said because you're still saying to them, how do I support you without, without really going into any, any personal issues that, that that individual should be able to deal with and address in their own time and in their own way. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And so it may not be until the fourth time you've offered, how can I support you that they finally say, hey, I'm ready to tell my colleagues that I am going through a gender transition. Can we talk about some ways to, to get that communicated? Right. But just reiterating, I'm here to support you. Is there anything I can do? And that does kind of leave the timing in the person's hands who's doing the transition to come forward when they're ready. I also liked when we were getting ready for um, the this recording, we were talking a little bit about those resistant employees and um, you were also, and I just want to give you an opportunity to say it again here, you were also saying to those individuals um, how, you know, they can be true to themselves and how we can be here to support you as well. Um, e even if you, if, even if, even those, those individuals that feel that the shift um, might be, might be somehow trampling on their own rights, whether they're right or wrong about that, they might have that belief. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I thought you gave great, great examples on how to address that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think it is completely appropriate to say to someone uh, who might be struggling with colleagues, um, say, in a gender transition or open about their same sex marriage, um, to be able to say, and you get to be a conservative Christian here in this work environment. Um, you get to affirmatively state that about yourself. And we are going to try to support and understand 
you as well. The line is when you make discriminatory comments about someone else coming forward with their identity um, who might come forward as being in a same-sex marriage or um, transitioning across a gender line, uh, that that's where, as a company, we're going to get involved, that we can't discriminate against each other, but we can all affirmatively show up in who we are and the identities that are important to us. And we can try to understand and support each other in that because then we'll all be better team players. That's fantastic advice, Kelby. Um, I don't I don't think any either Susan or I could have articulated um, these concepts and ideas uh, better ourselves. I, you give great explanations. My hope is that uh, next season you will come back because the law is changing in this area. And we'd like, to hear, <laughs> we'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, but we got a wrap for today. So thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you for joining us on today's podcast of Bees on the Law. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our podcast. We also welcome any comments. If you'd like to get in touch with us or suggest a future topic, you can email us at beesonthelaw at gmail.com. And because we're lawyers, we need to remind you that this podcast is not meant to provide you with legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.